If someone asks about the best methods of tafsir, we reply that the best method is to explain the Qur'an with the Qur'an itself. And we spoke about this earlier, that the tafsir of the Qur'an first starts, Qur'an, Qur'an, then the Sunni comes in. Astaghfirullah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We are uh, in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, the introduction, part two, lesson two. And we're dealing with the sources for Tafsir. I want to welcome everybody again. I had my microphone off, so I'm going to say this again. We're on the second part of the introduction for the Tafsir of Ibn Kathir. Jazakumullah khairan for everyone coming here. And let's get started. Alhamdulillah. If someone was to ask about the best methods for tafsir, we reply that the best method is to explain the Qur'an with the Qur'an itself. And this is what we already learned from Usul al-Tafsir. Qur'an, Qur'an, and then the Sunnan, and then we start with the language, and then we start with, you know, the opinion of the people after that. What is mentioned in general terms in one place in the Qur'an is usually explained in another place. When one does not find this easily, he should look into the sunnah because its purpose is to explain the Qur'an and elaborate upon its meanings. Allah says, Inna anzalna ilayka al-kitab bil-haqq litahkuma bayna al-nasi bima araka Allah. Allah says what could mean. The fact that matter is I've sent down to you the book with the truth, the reality. In order to make the hukum, to rule and judge over the between the people, with what Allah has shown you. And don't be an ar don't be arguing with the people uh, that just want to look for trouble. Okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He also says, what could mean? I'm sorry, Allah says in the Quran, so he says here, and we have not sent down to book the Quran to you, except that you may explain clearly unto them those things in which they differ, and as a guidance and a mercy, mercy for people who believe. So Allah is explaining to us the purpose of the Quran and the role of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in explaining the Qur'an and in using the Qur'an as a, as a means of judging between people. And Allah also says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّمُونَ وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ And I've sent down to you the reminder, again, another name for the Qur'an, Again, this reminder, the purpose of it, in order to, to to make it clear to the people, what has been revealed to them. So the Quran is sent down as a reminder to teach the people what and how they're supposed to apply the Quran. Okay? And that perhaps through this they can think properly, okay? And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu says, Ala inni utitu al-Qur'ana wa mithlahu ma'ahu. Ala, don't you know that? I was given the Qur'an and something with it along with it, meaning and it's some, uh, and something that's equal with it along with it. And this is in reference to the sunnah, meaning the prophet himself is embodying and explaining and, and, and how the Qur'an is supposed to be applied. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. 
The Sunnah was a revelation from Allah, just as the Quran, although it is not recited as the Quran is recited. Again, and this is a very important principle that we're starting off the very beginning of this tafsir by explaining that we have the Quran. Al Quran. And inside the Quran, we have the Quran that explains the Quran, right? And, and along with the Quran, we have the actions of the Messenger of Allah. Okay, these are the things that we have so far. The Sunnah was a revelation from Allah, just as the Quran, although it is not recited as the Quran is recited. So one seeks the tafsir of the Quran with the Quran itself and with the Sunnah. If one cannot find the tafsir in the Quran or the Sunnah, then he should refer to the statements of the companions. So then after this, then we look into the statements of the Sahaba. And next, okay? Who were the most knowledgeable of the tafsir for they witnessed the situations and the incidents that we did not witness. They also had the deepest comprehension, the, the most correct knowledge and the most righteous activities, especially the scholars and leaders amongst them. So then there's another note here that we have to recognize that there were particular Sahaba who were considered to be scholars even amongst the Sahaba. Not all the Sahaba were on the same level when it comes to you know, the level of knowledge they all had with regards to the Sunnah or with regards to the Quran. Okay, So especially those particular Sahaba. And who are they? So now we want to pay especially attention to these people's names so that we can, when we hear their statements, we can give it special attention, credit. First of the four rightly guided Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. And the righteous Imams, uh, this would say people, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu. Imam Abu Ja'far ibn Jarir al-Tabari narrated that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, by he, other than whom there is no God, no ayah in the book of Allah was revealed, but I have knowledge about whom it was revealed about and where it was revealed. Verily, if I knew of a person who had more knowledge than me in the book of Allah, that an animal could reach, meaning the means that they traveled on the animals. So we say that the animals could reach it, or as we would say today, that a vehicle of a plane or a jet or bike or car could get there, a boat, then I would have traveled to reach that person, inshallah, and he would have met him and learned from him. Also amongst the scholars of the companions is the great scholar in the sea of knowledge, Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Messenger of Allah and the one known as the explainer of the Quran. As a result of the blessings of the supplication of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi made dua to Allah to benefit Ibn Abbas. So Ibn Abbas, he was born three years right before the Hijrah. And Allah's Messenger made dua for him. He made dua for Ibn Abbas. Anhu. And his dua was Allahumma faqtihhu fi deen wa allimhu ta'weel. Oh Allah, give him faqtihhu fi deen. Give him fiqh of the deen. Okay? and teach him the proper interpretation of the book. Okay? So, alhamdulillah. Further, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari reported that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Now, we first started off by mentioning Abdullah ibn Mas'ud after the four rightly guided Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Right? So, he says about Ali, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, Yes, Ibn Abbas is the interpreter of the Qur'an. This hadith has an authentic chain of narratives. Ibn Mas'ud died in the 32nd year of Hijrah 
and Abdullah ibn Abbas lived for 36 more years after that. So the ulama mentioned this, that this Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was considered one of the, the greatest scholars amongst the Sahaba with regards to the Quran. And he says, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is the one to interpret the Quran. He is a scholar of the book. And that's, of course, before he dies. And then afterwards, Ibn Abbas lives 36 more years. So then the, the point here is, can you imagine how much more knowledge he acquired after the death of Ibn Mas'ud? Okay, so he says, what do you think about the knowledge that Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas collected after Ibn Mas'ud had passed away? Al-A'amash. Al-A'amash, again, this is one of the tabi'in, said that Abu Nwa'il said, Ali once appointed Abdullah ibn Abbas to lead the Hajj season. Abu Wa'il is a Sahabi. He says, Ali once appointed Abu Abdullah ibn Abbas to lead the Hajj season. Ibn Abbas gave a speech to the people in which he read and explained Surah Al-Baqarah and according to another narration, Surah Al-Nur, in such a way that even if the Romans, the Turks, and the Dailem had heard it, they would have all embraced Islam. I mean, the, the, the speech, in his opinion, was so uh, provocative, so uh, had so much delil in it, that even if those people who were kufar at that time, they would have heard the speech, they would have been enticed to uh, join Islam. Uh, this is why the majority of the knowledge of knowledge, Ismail ibn Abdurrahman al-Suddi al-Kabir, collected in his tafsir, is from these two men, Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Abbas. Yet he sometimes mentions that they now what they narrated of the Israelite accounts that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has allowed when he said, He says here, and this is an authentic hadith that was narrated, or this hadith from Abdullah ibn Amr was collected by Al Bukhari. And it's explained in Fatul Bari. So let's go back and read the hadith. He says, anni ayah. Narrate. Balligu doesn't necessarily mean narrate, it means make it reach the next person. So convey on my behalf. Okay? Talk about me. Say what you learned from me, even if it's only just one ayah. Okay? وَحَدِّثُوا عَنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ And حَدِّثُوا means narrate the hadith, the statements of Bani Israel, that you get from Bani Israel, وَلَا حَرَجْ And there is no problem. It doesn't mean no sin alone. لَا حَرَجْ You got nothing to feel bad about. It's very important. وَمَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا But whoever lies upon me intentionally, then let him have his seat in the fire. Okay, so how do we understand this narration? Okay, because we see nowadays a lot of the different uh, publishers are taking the Israelite out of the books like this book, Ibn Kathir, and other books, or they make statements like, oh, but he narrates the Israelite as though there's a problem with that. We have to pay attention to follow the Messenger of Allah and not get caught up in what some of the politics are today. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hadithu an Bani Israel wa la haraj. Narrate the narrations that we get from Bani Israel and there's no problem with that, okay? The fact that some of the scholars have a problem with that is not our problem. We are have to hold the stance that the Prophet وسلم, narrated on. Now, we have to put that in some type of conduct, context. Allah's Messenger in the same narration says, Woman kadaba but whoever lies, because wa can also mean but. So, but whoever lies, okay, and whoever lies about me intentionally. So now with regards to the narrating from Bani Israel. If and when we know that their statement is a pure lie, then we don't narrate that narration. Okay? Well, how would we know? Of course, we would know when it corresponds with what we already have, 
or it, it opposes what we have. So these are two extremes. If it corresponds, then we know it's not a lie. If it does not correspond, but it goes directly against what we have, then we know that that is a lie and we don't narrate that narration. Does that make sense? Because that's an intentional. Okay? Then we have to watch out for that. Hope that makes sense. So it goes on to say, this is why Abdullah, when Abdullah ibn Amr had possession of two books from the people of the scripture on the day of the battle of Yarmouk, he used to narrate what was in them because of what he understood of the hadith that allowed this practice. So now we have another thing here. We have an action of a sahabi, Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As, okay? Famous sahabi, a well-known sahabi. So he's narrating, as we see here, after the battle of Yarmouk, the scriptures that he finds in the books from the people of the scripture, people of the book of Jews and the Christians. Okay, because of what he understood. And we don't see that the other Sahaba had a problem with that or stopped him from doing that. That makes sense? So we call this a precedence. We call this the understanding of the Salaf. <clears throat> Ibn Kathir states, yet yeah, the Israeli accounts and stories should only be used as supporting evidence. And so now we put a cave on there. They are not hujjah not as evidence themselves. They supporting evidence. They support what we already have. There are three types of these accounts and tales, a kind that we are sure is authentic because we have in our religion something that testifies to its truth. Like I said, it corresponds to that. The second type we know to be false because it's based on what we have. We have something and it goes directly opposite. We know it's false. The third type is of neither, meaning it speaks of something that is not confirmed with what we have, nor does it oppose what we have. Does that make sense? So we may narrate this type, but we don't say this is the hot. We say this is what they say. Hence, we neither affirm nor deny this type. And we are allowed to narrate it, and there ain't no problem with that. Okay? Because of the hadith that we mentioned earlier. The majority of these are of no, what he calls religious benefit. I don't like to use the word religious benefit because that term has no practical benefit. What is meant by this statement, the majority of these statements that come from Bani Israel, there's no way that we can do something applicable with them, meaning nothing we can take from them and now we can now do something better we can, there's no act of ibadah that we can now do. It's not going to help us offer salah, pay zakah, make hajj and tawaf and, 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 and umrah or, or any of the other things or fast Ramadan. It's added information about some particular detail. Okay? For instance, an Israelite tale mentions the names and the number of the people in the cave and the color of their dog doesn't it doesn't hurt us and it doesn't help us okay it may be more motivating but it's not going to help us worship allah in a better fashion because of that and allah knows best they also include the type of tree musa's staff was made of and the kind of birds ibrahim brought back to life by the permission of allah okay and the part of the cow that the dead Israelite was struck with to resurrect him, and the kind of tree that Allah spoke to Musa through. These are examples of the things that Allah left unexplained or unmentioned in the Quran and do not carry any daily religious significance for responsible adults. Responsible is mukallifun here. And it's what I'll say. There's no, no act of ibadah that we can do. There's nothing extra that comes with these things. So it's added ascetics to beautify the narration now we're moving on we're on the next section the tafsir of the tabi'un the tafsir of the tabi'un first and foremost 
who are the Tabi'in? I mentioned uh, uh, Ibn al-Jarir al-Tawri earlier, and he has this extensive tafsir that everyone pulls from. Okay, so that's why you're going to hear it mentioned a lot of times. He's considered the imam of all the scholars of tafsir and one of the first ones. So the tafsir of the Tabi'in. The Tabi'in are those people who were the students of the Sahaba. And they themselves gathered, you know, compiled tafsir out of their own studies with the Sahaba. When unable to find the tafsir in the Quran, the Sunnah, or with the companions themselves, the, the Sahaba, the scholars then look to the tafsir of the Tabi'in, the second and third generation. So you have Tabi'in, which when we say Tabi'in, we mean the Tabi'in themselves and the Atba'ab Tabi'in. So there's two generations of them, okay? Such as Mujahid ibn Jab, who was a wonder himself in tafsir. Muhammad ibn Ishaq narrated that Abban ibn Salih said that Mujahid said, I reviewed the Mus'haf with ibn Abbas three times from beginning to end, asking him about each and every ayah in it. So we see that Mujahid is now the student of Ibn Abbas. We want to pay, pay note to these particulars because as we go through this, we want to know who's speaking. We just don't want to have this like that whole Charlie Brown, wah, 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 someone speaking and we, there's no context of who he is. Why is his statement important? And for this reason, I encourage you to read the stories of these tabi'in. They have them in many different books and online. Even some of them are their movies made out of. They're legendary. And some people say, well, I don't want to watch a movie about the person or read a book that some of it may not be true. Like I said, they're legendary. And it's strange that some of us would say that and then watch TV programs that are straight lies. Okay. So, you know, we have to balance our mind. We need to learn about who these people are so that it would enhance our ability to appreciate what they say, which would help us better apply and remember the Quran, which would help us better get into Jannah. <clears throat> so Ibn Abbas's student Mujahid is the first person that's mentioned. Also Ibn Jarir, again, it's Ibn Jarir of Tabal narrated that uh, Ibn Abi Mulaika said, I am sorry, said, I saw Mujahid asking Ibn Abbas about the tafsir of the Quran while he was holding his tablets, his papers. Ibn Abbas would say to him, write until Mujahid asked him about the entire tafsir. This is why Sufyan al-Thawri said, if the tafsir reaches you from Mujahid, then it is sufficient for you. And there's going to be many statements we hear in this tafsir from Mujahid, inshallah. The scholars of tafsir also include Sa'id ibn Jubair. Sa'id ibn Jubair is another famous person. He was murdered by Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Sa'id ibn Jubair was considered a scholar even amongst the tabi'in. Okay? Great scholar. They said when he died, knowledge went underground that would never come up again. And there are stories written about Sa'id for you to hear about him. And he also was a friend of Ibn Abbas. Iqrima, the freed slave of Ibn Abbas, another. Ibn Abbas had many students that we're going to hear from. Atta Ibn Abi Rabah. Atta is known for having big spoon nose. Al Hassan al Basri. The main person that the people, the Sufis, looked towards because he was a Zahid. And even the, 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 the wives and, 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 and the Prophet ﷺ had a special place for him. Masruq ibn al-Ajda. He was called Masruq because he was kidnapped when he was a child. And then they found him and took him back. And so they nicknamed him Masruq, the one that was stolen. Okay? Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib or Musayyib, there's always difference of opinion whether his name is ibn al-Musayyib with the Fatah or Musayyib, 
with the Kesra and the famous scholar Abu Aliya, Al Rabi' Ibn Anas, Qatada, Al Dahak Ibn Muzahim, and other scholars from amongst the Tabi'een. And if I sat here and gave you stories of each one of them, it will take up all of our time. It is imperative, though, that you know who each and every one of these people are, okay, as we go forward, so that we could, when we hear from them, we appreciate their statements. And these amongst the scholar, other scholars among the tabi'in of the following generations. The statements of these imams should be mentioned and referred to for tafsir. We should mention here that these scholars use a variety of meanings for some words, leading those who do not have enough knowledge to think they are in conflict with each other, and thus they consider them to be opposing statements. This is not correct. For some of these scholars would use variations of the same expressions, and some of them would use other precise terms. These meanings are all the same in the majority of instances, and those who have no sound comprehension, sorry, and those who have sound comprehension can see this, and Allah is the one who guides and directs to success. What is mentioning here is that a person, again, has to, number one, have knowledge of the Arabic language when reading such a book, meaning I'm reading this in English now, but of course I've read this in Arabic. And not only read it in Arabic, read the statements of these particular scholars, and you get used to their style, okay? How they talk as individuals. So that when you see their statements in this particular instance, you know what they mean by that particular statement, okay? Sometimes you hear a scholar say in the science of hadith, so-and-so, he's a sheikh. That doesn't mean that that person is a scholar. That means he's just an old man. Say, so someone that doesn't know that that's what that scholar means when he says sheikh, okay, then he thinks he's giving them a praiseworthy common statement when actually he's giving them a, a moderate. Oh, he's a nice old man. He's, la bets a bihi. No, nothing wrong with him. Some people say la bets. There's nothing wrong with that person. And they mean you should take from him. And other people say la bets bihi. And they may mean that that person yeah, he's all right. Nothing, you know. So you have to understand what that particular scholar's terms are before you go and assume. And that takes a lot of reading and asking other scholars who have learned it from other scholars. And this has become a thing that's passed down through the generations. This becomes the next route. Tafsir by opinion comes next. So now we're on the next part, the tafsir by opinion. I like the way he starts us. He starts us off with a prohibition. It is prohibited to indulge in tafsir by mere opinion. Now, many of us say we want to take from Ibn Kathir. Take this from Ibn Kathir. Because this is one of the things that I believe we have fallen into due to the internet. Okay? Due to the, the ability of a person being able to Google something, and then when they Google it, and they say, well, I read it, but again, they don't, they're not a qualified researcher. They're not a mufassir or a student of tafsir to the point where they can understand how to take statements, and you know, and sometimes just taking statements from here and there from any old person, or even from qualified people, but out of context. And then they add to that, what they want that would support the opinion they already have or that they want to promote. It is prohibited to indulge in tafsir by mere opinion. We have to understand that. Muhammad ibn Jarir of Tabari reported that Ibn Abbas said that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Man qala fi al-Qur'ani bi ra'yihi aw bi ma la ya'lamu he says again, whoever speaks about the Quran, utilizing his opinion, or, or saying something he has no knowledge of, he don't know. This is important. Or what he doesn't know. 
Okay, then let him have a seat in the fire. Okay, this is very important to understand because how can you know it when you have not fulfilled the prerequisites of knowledge? Not being knowing a little bit of Arabic is not sufficient. You must be a master of the Arabic language, meaning a master's degree level in the in the language. You must have sat with a scholar of tafsir and been taught by this particular person, you specifically, okay? So that he hand teaches you just like any other skill that you go to school and learn about that particular thing. Not that you think on your own and you go about your own business. So we have to be very careful about this because this is what causes so much friction, so much ikhtilaf, where we have people giving fatawa and thinking that they have delil because they are making tafsir based on their opinion. And may Allah protect us from continuing in this evil habit. Okay? At-Tirmidhi, Al-Nasai, and Abu Dawood have recorded this hadith and it is a had hasan hadith. Explaining what one has knowledge of, otherwise be quiet. The Salaf. And we're referring to the first three generations when we refer to the Salaf. We're not talking about anybody else. The Salaf used to refrain from explaining what they had no knowledge of. For, for instance, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari reported that Abu Ma'mar said that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhum ajma'in said with Kameem, which land will carry me and which heaven will shade me if I said about Allah's book that which, is, which I have no knowledge of. And the narration I have doesn't have which heaven will shade me, has which sky, okay, will shade me. And, and if I say about Allah's book, that which I have no knowledge of. This is, telling, this is teaching us the stance that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq had with regards to speaking, and he is the closest of the closest of Sahaba. Ibn Jariya also reported that Anas narrated that Umar ibn al-Khattab read the ayah, he says, and the fakiha and the fruit wa and the abba is like the green stuff that the animals eat. Okay, the herbage, the, the grass, and the, the, the little you know flowers and bushes. He he said this while he was standing on the minbar, and then he said, "We know the fruit. We know what fakiha is. So what is this abba?" Then he caught himself and he said, Yeah, Omar, this is exaggeration, meaning you're going too far. This is not exaggeration, this is going to extremes. This is going too far. This statement means that Omar briefly wanted to know the exact, get really detailed. Which Abba is it? What are we referring to here? Then it became evident to him that it was a plant that grows on the earth. That's it, it's a plant. Again, like we stated earlier, that some of the, most of the Israelites have no practical benefit, right? There's nothing we can do with some of the information we get from the Israelites, right? Likewise, sometimes we want to go so deep into the meaning in a place that it's not appropriate and it's not going to benefit us. So we have to be balanced. We know it's a plant on the earth. Kefa bidari. Sufficient is that for us to know. Okay? Allah says in the Quran, فَأَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا حَبًّا وَعِنَبًا وَقَضْبًا Okay? And we cause therein the grain to grow, and grapes and clover plants, green fodder for the cow. Ibn Jariya also recorded that Ibn Abi Mulaika said that Ibn Abbas was asked about an ayah. That if any of you were asked about it, they would have indulged in the tafsir. Without habitation, Ibn Abbas refused to say anything about it, meaning he refused to speak about it with his own opinion. This narration has an authentic chain of narrators. He also narrated that Ibn Abi Mulaika said a man asked Ibn Abbas about this particular ayah. A day, the space whereof is a thousand years. 
يوم كان مقدار مقدار is a period of time its length a day whose length is a thousand years sounds simple to me okay sounds very simple a day whose whose is a thousand years okay but Ibn Abbas said you know I don't know what is that he asked Ibn Abbas responded to his question with another question he said what is يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة a day the مقدار who is fifty thousand years they both come in the Quran does it get the point the man said I only asked for you to tell me <laughs> Ibn Abbas said there are two days that's what they are there are two days that Allah has mentioned in his book and he has more knowledge of it than any of them. You know, he knows best what that means. He disliked commenting on the book of Allah when he had no knowledge about it. I Meaning that there's no way. He said it's 50,000 years. He said it's a thousand years. Allah knows what it is. These are two days. Is it the same day? What? I don't know. Okay. So Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Is there anything you can do with that ayah? You get it? It's not, it's not one of the ayah that we can now take and say, well, now I'm going to apply that as a better Muslim in my life. Rather, these are two days that I believe in. This is what we have to remember about the Quran early as a principle. I believe in it. That's sufficient. I believe that it's from Allah. That's sufficient. And then you'll benefit from it. I hope that makes sense. Al-Layth narrated that Yahya ibn Sa'id said that Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib used to talk about what he knew of the Qur'an. Tabari narrates. And you see there's lots of mention of al-Tabari because I told you Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he has the most extensive, he's considered the imam of tafsir. But we're not suggested for us to read that tafsir when you're a new, a beginner of tafsir because there's so much in it, there are things that are weak. There's so much different other stuff that you have to first learn tafsir step by step, and then you can benefit. Maybe somebody, may Allah bless some of the kibar or the ulama to take that tafsir and do a tahqiq of the whole thing. It's very ex extensive. May Allah give someone tawfiq to do that. I mean, a late narrated that Yahya ibn Sa'id said that Sa'id ibn al Musayyib narrated, I mean, used to talk about what he knew about the Quran. Tabari narrates that. Also, Ayyub, Ayyub ibn Aun and Hisham of Dastuwai narrated that Muhammad ibn Sirin said, I asked Ubaidah, meaning a Salmani, about an ayah of the Quran, and he said, Those who had knowledge about the circumstances surrounding that particular revelation have died, have perished. So, it and seek the right way. So fear Allah the best way you can, okay? And this is a beautiful mawqif for us because sometimes, again, we say we want to know, right? I just want to know. But we have what is sufficient for us to work with right now. All we have to do is say, آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلٌّ مِّنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا Right? We believe in all of it. It's all from our Lord. It's all we have to do in those things where we cannot get more clarity. Okay? Alhamdulillah, you Rabbil Ameen. So we work with those things that we can get clarity and that we do have clarity from. Those who have knowledge about the circumstances surrounding the revelation of the Quran have perished. Beautiful statement. So fear Allah and seek the right way. Ash-Sha'bi narrated that Masruq said, avoid tafsir. Because it is narration related to Allah. Meaning don't be so quick to speak because you're speaking about Allah. Just like you don't like somebody to go and say, you know what Khalila said? As soon as I say that, Miss Khalila is going to be like, she's going to get nervous to think, what did I say? I hope he says it right. I hope it's not something he does. I don't want him to say that I said. Does that make sense? As a human, we're going to feel like that. So we need to be careful because we're talking about Allah says, oh, whoa, you're speaking about Allah. Do you, are you sure he wants you to say that? Are you sure you're representing it appropriately? 
So this is why he's saying, avoid tefsir. Be careful. Don't be so quick to put yourself forward to write a check with Allah's name on it. Does that make sense? These authentic narrations from the companions and the imams of the Salaf, the first three generations, testify to their hesitation to indulge in the tafsir of what they had no knowledge of. As for those who speak about what they have linguistic and religious knowledge of, you see how we put that forward? Again, I keep saying this because I want people to understand the importance of not only Arabic, like sometimes people say, oh man, Arabic, that's nothing. It is a lot of something to know. And religious knowledge, knowing the Sharia, you have to know the laws as they have been canonized, meaning organized. What is the straight laws? And then when you can understand what Allah is referring to, these things are supportive. It becomes a circular knowledge. One is supporting the other. As for those who speak about what they have linguistic and religious knowledge of, then there is no sin in this case. Okay? Hence, the scholars and the imams, including the ones mentioned, we mentioned, and issued statements of tafsir and spoke about what they had knowledge of, but avoided what they had no knowledge of. This is called insaf. This is called being balanced. Okay? The student teacher, the scholar, has to remember to say, I don't know. He has to also remember to prepare himself with sufficient enough knowledge and not think that his little that he has is sufficient. He has to work on it years after years after years until this becomes part and parcel of their personality and of what they breathe of the sciences and not just think, I just got enough and that's sufficient. And mediocrity is not sufficient. I was watching on my phone I, I like martial arts, so I was watching on the phone the guy, I uh, forget his name now, but he does a lot of comedy martial arts, Jackie Chan, and he got an award, a uh, golden award for being a, an actor, and he said he has been working in the, the movies for 56 years. He's made 200 movies, been a part of 200 movies movies and now after that time he got an award the award the golden award for whatever they give that for and i took a lesson from that as we all should okay it doesn't happen overnight but it does happen overnight and nights and you have to be in the business Constantly, never giving up, working at learning the trade that you want to be known by. If you want to indulge in tafsir, you must live tafsir, breathe tafsir, take all the prerequisites to become a mufassir and continue to read all of them until this is something that you can do with a little bit more ease. So may Allah give us and those people who wish to do that the tawfiq to do this. Hence, the scholars and the imams, including the ones we mentioned, issued statements of tafsir and spoke about what they had knowledge of, but avoided what they had no knowledge of. Refraining from indulging in what one has no knowledge of is required of everyone, just as everyone is, likewise, required to convey the knowledge that they have when they are asked. Okay, so there's a double-edged sword here. You will have to be quiet when you don't know, and you have to speak when you do know. Okay. Some people used to say in the military, unfortunately, you know the drill. Okay. Why you got to go? Well, unfortunately, your team knows how to do this. Likewise, we have to speak when we know what, we have, what we're saying. So, alhamdulillah, may Allah give it to us. Allah says first part of it you will la here is is emphasis the noon here is key you will clarify and make this clear to the people okay 
Wala taktumun in the second part, and you will not conceal it. You will not hide it. Oh, they ain't ready for this. They ain't your place to say it. You're asked, you give it. Also, a hadith narrated through several chains of narrators. Man su'ila an ilmin fakatama uljima yom al qiyamati bilijamin minna minnarin. He says, Man su'ila min ilmin fakatama. Whoever is asked about any knowledge and he conceals it, he will be wearing a lijam, a bit on the day of a day of standing, a bit of fire will be placed in his mouth. Okay. He says a muzzle. The hijab is the thing that the, the piece of bit that you put inside the horse's mouth like that. So that we put in his, his mouth. May Allah protect us from this. And that ends our subject for today. The subject was the sources of tafsir. Okay. And we covered that five sources. Then we turned around and we talked about the importance of speaking or how we deal with Bani Israel and the narration from Bani Israel and those are three types. The ones that confirm or we have confirmed in the Quran and the Sunnah, the ones that oppose the Quran and the Sunnah and those that neither confirm nor oppose the Quran and the Sunnah. And those middle ones are the ones we narrate and we don't say it is exactly like this we say this is what was narrated by bani israel and maybe the people who are listening can apply it and find a way to benefit from that better than the ones who spent who said it and then we are warned of the importance of not just taking from the salaf what they said but how they went about being cautious about not speaking about what they didn't know how we look at those ayat that are like those ayat from Bani Israel. We look at it and we can't see what we can do to apply it. Like Allah mentioning Alpha uh, Sana, a day miqdaruhu Alpha Sana, okay? Or Khamsina Sana, it being Khamsa hum, Alif Sana, Khamsina Alif Sana, 50,000 years or 1,000 years. These types of ayat, we may not be able to apply them in our daily life, but we have i'tiqad in them. We blindly believe in them. And it's not blindly because we know it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we believe in them in their totality. That these are days as Allah has described them and we don't know anything else about them, but we believe in it. And in that way, we get benefit of them. We don't speak and, and suppose about it without any knowledge. And I hope that that is enough as an introduction. We still have more. Ibn Kathir does more. These introductions to tafsir are very important. Just like we went through the in the usul of tafsir this introduction to tafsir is supportive of what we already have read and is setting us up as we go forward uh, to read the tafsir of ibn kathir i hope what i have read benefits you makes you a better person motivates you to know the book of allah and is a means of of causing us to make tawbah and being more sincere to Allah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أُمِنُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ دِينَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ أَشْهَدُوا اللَّهِ إِلَهِ لَعَنْ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَأَتُوبُ لَيْكَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ If there's any uh, questions, somebody can ask them. Please go ahead about what we've covered. That's it. Ya Sheikhuna, Ya Sheikhana, would this example fall under speaking without knowledge? You listened to a tafsir and what amazed you from the tafsir class? Anis or Ar Rahman, Anas or Ar Rahman, epitome or fullness of the quality. Can you chat to your friend that that was amazing? No, that is not speaking without knowledge. It's all about the attribution. How do you speak? 
and let's say you don't have a certain level of Arabic or something like that, but you're taking a class, you, you say, okay, you say, I learned. I learned this in the class, and this is what I understood. You own it, okay, own it. That's one way. That makes sense? Own it. And that's what we, we, we miss for a lot of times. I believe this. This is what I learned. This is what I benefited from. Alhamdulillah. I mean, somebody else says, well, that's, you know, I don't think that's amazing. Well, peace. We don't got to fight. I like that point. I think that point that benefited me. I wanted to share it with you. You know, they'll benefit or they don't benefit. But you did your, what, what you wanted to do, inshallah. Ta'ala, and you, you owned it. Sheikh, if a child has the name Jalib or Khalib, Jaliya, should he change it? Does it relate to Kel in Arabic since the Yahoo like to play with the two words? Uh, uh, um Khadija, I, oh, Kelib, oh, Kelib, okay. These are not the type of questions I wanted to answer in the class, in this particular class, but I will answer this one, inshallah ta'ala. The, it is my belief, my personal belief, that when we come to Islam, we should make a khula of those things that came before. That, you know, you know, we in the West, a lot of times, we're 100% down for whatever we were dealing with in Jahiliya. And which really we don't have a Jahiliya, but you know, our personal life as Kufar prior to Islam. And then we come to Islam and then we start like, you know, halfway with it. No, come all the way. Allah says, enter into Islam 100% all the way down. So I believe personally that anybody who comes to Islam should take on a Muslim name, a name that identifies you, uh, especially, uh, yes, especially for those people from those ethnic groups like African who were enslaved in the United States whose names are don't even identify them ethnically or um, Islamically, you know, and this is what names that, that naming is supposed to do. So I think that they should take on name that identifies them in their deen at the very least. That's my personal opinion. You know, the, the, you know, okay, so Caleb is mentioned in the Bible, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know what I mean? And then you say, you know, as a servant of Allah, you, it's, that's not the way we go about accepting that type of uh, narration, you know? The, uh, the, the right, the people who we look to as being servants of Allah are those, again, who are confirmed through Islamic uh, literature in that regard. So I wouldn't take that, even though I'm familiar with the term, you know, Alhamdulillah, it's better for a person to take the name from the Muslim Islamic sources, inshallah. Okay? And I, I would not be pleased for uh, any of my family members or anybody to advise to keep a name from Jahaniyyah. I would advise them to take upon uh, Islamic Islamic names. They're clearly Muslim. There's a growing trend nowadays for um, from people who come to Islam to keep uh, their kafir names even if it even let's say it's the prophet's name i'm not of those people that agree that that's like that i think that's you know again part of the rebelliousness that we have the resistance that we have to islam and i'm going to do it my way this is a good enough it may be but what is clear is that if you take a muslim name you'll be safe does that make sense?
And the lost messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, leave that which makes you doubt for that which does not make you doubt. And that's where I'll stop today. Wa subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Wa salamu alaykum.